Hi, bio students. I wanted to take a chance to walk through these graphs with you. Um, I realized that some of them were pretty difficult and not having the class time to look at graphs and analyze them um, is kind of a disadvantage. So I wanted to give you that opportunity here. First thing you want to look at when you look at any of these types of ecological graphs is you want to look at what's on the y-axis, what's on the x-axis. Look at your title so that you can figure out what type of graph it is. First of all, it's rabbits over time. You'll notice the number of rabbits are on the y-axis, the uh, months are on the x-axis. So this is clearly a population graph. And you'll also notice that it has a huge amount of growth right here, which corresponds to June. Um, and that answers our question C, the exponential growth happens here in June. The next thing that we can derive from this is the carrying capacity. The carrying capacity is where it levels off. Um, you'll notice that the rabbit population grows and then it stops right here. That's about the amount of uh, rabbits that this particular area can handle. And if you go back over here, you'll see I estimated it to be about 65 rabbits that this popular that this particular area could handle because I looked at where it leveled off and then I backtracked and looked here. The next type of graph that we see is um, a graph comparing two different eras in time, 1800s and 2000. It's looking at the length of our big toes and humans. This you'll notice on the y-axis is, is thousands of people, so 20,000, 40,000, 120,000. And here you'll notice some strange things with this x-axis. Um, much to our dismay, it goes from 2, 3, 4, then to 6 and 8. Um, I would have preferred this graph to be expanded out and to continue the same pattern. I would recommend that if you are graphing anything, that those are the procedures that you would use. Uh, this is the data that was given sometimes on standardized test I've seen them do things of this nature so just be really careful if you ever see a graph like that I went ahead and labeled here five and seven to help myself so that I didn't make an error when I was trying to estimate these things for the questions so the first question asked me in 1800 so the little thin line is 1800 how many people had a three centimeter toe? So I'm going to go to three here, the three centimeter toe. I'm gonna to go over here and I'm gonna estimate that to be about 55,000 people. Again, remember these are thousands of people. And then in 2000, right here, it seems to be pretty much on that line, it's 10,000 people. The data shows that natural selection has occurred here, meaning that more people in 1800 had a three centimeter toe than do now. And that's what they're trying to get at here. But when it comes to this, the next question on the back, you'll notice, and I'm not gonna switch it until I get through to show you on this graph. It wants to know the average toe length for 2000 and 1800. Well, to find the average, I'm looking for where it plateaus here. And you'll notice I've marked it on this graph. And in my opinion, both of those are about 4.75 centimeters and haven't really changed that much. So this would be the opposite argument about natural selection. If the average is the same, is it really changing? Or are the number of outliers changing? The data is really only 200 years, so there's really not enough or a long enough time for us to ascertain that particular thing about natural selection. Next, let's look at this population graph. The population graph here is um, kind of like bar graphs stacked along each other. There's a lot going on. Um, if you look on the computer, you can see the colors and it. it's very helpful. This side has male, this side has female. We have um, age groups along here. We have percentages here. So the total percent, we would have to add each up. Um, and this is the percent of population. This is Mexico's population in comparison to the United States population. Okay, the first question wants to know what percent of Mexico's population is between zero and four. So you'll notice there's 8% of females and 8% of males. Gives you a total of 16%. 
Next, it's going to want to know for the United States. In that case, I estimated this to be three and this to be four, so I got about seven. Technically, that might be a little over three, but around 7% of the United States has um, children under four. Okay, which population is growing the fastest? You can clearly see a curve here. And that is showing you that Mexico's population is going to grow much faster. It has a continual curve. We have a couple of things going on. Although the population of 15 through 19 is growing because we've gone up, it's actually decreasing here. So we're seeing um, fluctuations in our population, which is pretty normal. Um, and population growth, but they're seeing steady growth here in, in Mexico. And which group has the smallest number in both countries? Um, definitely 80 plus, although there are more, um, females that are over 80 here. I think that if we added that together, we would find that number is just slightly smaller than this one. So I would say both countries, people over 80 is the smallest percent of the population, which makes sense since the average, uh, I don't know, the average human life cycle is 78 right now, I think. Life expectancy is 78. Okay, let's look at the trapping geese. And let's take a look at what's happening here. So what happened in northern Wisconsin, they marked 10 geese. They either tagged them with some kind of tag or put a, a chip or somehow they marked 10 geese and released them back into the population. They studied these geese um, over six years. Here um, you see the number of geese trapped. And these were the numbers that they found, the wild geese with the mark. Okay, we've got a formula here at the bottom that tells us how to calculate the average number of geese in this area. And to figure out how many number of geese were studied, you take the total captured and you multiply it by the number marked. In this case, we marked 10. And then you divide it by the total recaptured with the mark. So the total number of geese captured would be all these numbers together and I got 60. The total number um, marked were 10 originally and the total number recaptured with the mark if I add up these numbers I get 6. So I found that there are 60 geese that were studied. The technique is actually called catch and release and it's utilized through many ecological studies and utilized often in ecology. Okay. Now, C here asks you if more of the geese that they retrapped had the mark, would it make the estimated number of geese studied less or more? It would be less because that number six would be greater and would be dividing by a bigger numerator, numerator or denominator, and that would make um, for less lesser. Uh, number of geese being studied because we were catching more of our marked ones and so there would be less geese in the area and less being studied. All right, this mushroom plot. So again, in nature, it's really hard to count for every single thing um, and it it's really time consuming and it takes a while and we can't possibly count every mushroom in the forest um, or every whatever plant we're studying or whatever we might be studying. So they use these grids often to help and they'll quadrant it out and then they'll at random pick some grids and so you notice right here there were five grids that were randomly counted the number of mushrooms um, I did a little bit of math here to figure out that the total here were 15 mushrooms we had 8 plus 2 is 10 plus the 2 is 5 and there were five total spots so the average for these five spots were three mushrooms notice there are a hundred of these such areas quadrated off and so because of that there would be about 300 mushrooms in the area this technique has many different names but quadrant sampling is what I hear it called most often all right finally we're gonna look at a population um, where we look at both predator and prey in this case we're looking at snakes and mice and we're looking at how these populations interact with one another and how they change and how their carrying capacities really do affect one another, particularly in a predator-prey situation. Um, in past years, I did a predator-prey game. Um, it's one of my favorite things to do, so maybe we'll do it when we come back just for fun. Um, 
So let's take a look at what's going on. You'll notice that you've got your years. Every 10 years or so, they are keeping record, except for the last year, they do it for one year, right between to see the pattern that's going on. Um, you'll notice that uh, this is the my, mouse born. These are just the number of snakes. Mice born and mice died. Snakes have a longer life expectancy, so they were just looking at the mice here. I went ahead and did born minus death so they could get numbers here. I also did a calculation of the population. I went ahead and started with the 800 that we have originally, and then I kept adding in these mice because you'll notice that you added 500 more here. We subtracted 100 here. We added 50 more, 20 more, 60 more, but that gives me a true population of the mice over here to the side. Um, and I just continued to add them to each one, assuming that the ones from the previous years were still living and in, in this area, in this field. All right, so the first question that it asked is, it asked us, did, during which year did the mouse population, was it at a zero growth? Well, there's only one year that the mouse population didn't grow, and that's where it was actually at a negative growth. And that would be when snakes got to 30 snakes in this experimental field. So clearly the predators outweighed the prey and had a negative effect on their uh, population. Okay, the next thing wants to know the carrying capacity for snakes. Well, in this particular situation, which we must remember that it's dependent on the population of, mouse, of mice as well, it does seem to be 30. The carrying capacity for snakes is 30 because it goes up to 30 and then goes back down. Now, again, don't forget that it is definitely dependent on mouse population. So with that being said, the carrying capacity for mice, I estimate it to be about 1,300. We've got a couple of things going on. Right here it goes up to 1,300, and then it starts to go up again. I do suspect that if we continued this pattern that we would have more and more snakes, and then eventually it would drop back down. So I estimate it to be about 1,300. I would need some more data to really verify that, though. Again, it's also dependent on the snakes population. It could be higher if there were fewer snakes. All right, the rate of growth. Rate of growth is found by taking how many were born minus how many died and then divided by the population growth at the time. So you'll notice um, in this 1970, I had 800 born, 300 died, and then my population was actually 1,300 because I had the 500 new ones um, divided by the 8 or added to the 800. So we wound up with a 38% increase. It would be about 60% increase if you took it by the previous population. Um, sometimes they do that. Uh, you would have to look at your particular assignment and see which way they're going if they're doing the whole total current population or the previous population. All right. I chose to do the total current population for this these calculations. And then you'll notice right here we had a negative 8% decrease in mice on the year 1980. All right. Thank you guys. Keep up the great work. I am going to make another video for the um, knapweed uh, invasion and I move the date to the Friday. That's the day that we will do a Skyward very small quiz over the ecology unit. You will need to log into your Skyward. I want you to do your own work. And I want to see how well you do. If you do do not do well, again, it will not hurt you at all. Um, but I really need it as a diagnostic tool to see how well you're able to learn this material remotely. Thank you guys. Again, stay safe and keep up the great work.